Uh, this is like an incredible honor to be here. I, have, I had no idea there would be this many people. This is amazing. We're incredibly honored, excited, and absolutely terrified <laughs> to be here right now. So, um, as I think you alluded to earlier, I'm going to start off with a quick question. How many of you guys like taking public transportation? Okay, all right, all right. Now, how many of, you, how many of those same people enjoy paying for public transportation? I see, I see a couple hands, okay. Well, for those of you with your hands up, it's a good opportunity to avert your eyes if you want. Um, but for everybody else, I actually have a little bit of bad news to start off with because um, as our local transit agency's lawyers have instructed us to say and put on our title slide, the MBTA does not endorse or encourage this type of conduct. We're debating fares and are hacking the MBTA fare system is illegal, and the MBTA takes these matters seriously. Anyone caught engaging in this type of behavior will be referred to appropriate law enforcement agency. The MBTA has implemented mitigation measures to address some of these concerns. Okay. <laughs> so, now we can begin. So, um, actually, are any of these... No, these aren't even up here. Um, let's see. It should, it should, the slide should be appearing, right? I think we're having a bit of trouble. Okay, we're on it? Good. Uh, yeah, so I'll just explain who we are. Um, so we don't actually have any real like qualifications or anything. We don't work at any fancy cybersecurity companies, not yet anyway. Um, we're vocational high school students from Medford, Massachusetts. Um, we call ourselves amateur miscreants. Uh, we really like to make stuff, but we also like to break stuff. And we don't really like being told what to do. Um, and we're also part of an underwater robotics team um, at our school called Sunk Robotics. Participate in a competition called the Mate ROV competition. A lot of fun, and it's brought the four of us a lot closer together. So, um, it, let's see. It's helpful. Yeah. Okay, so I have pictures up here of us, but uh, you'll just have to take a look at us here. So it's me, Zach, Scott, and Noah. So <clears throat> you might be wondering what you're actually going to get out of this talk. Uh, well, if you live in Boston and you're paying attention, you'll get free rides on the MBTA. Uh, you also, if you don't, you can get lessons on how to reverse engineer a transit card and more generally some lessons on reverse engineering. You also get a lesson on how to talk to a government agency and how to not end up in handcuffs when you do so. And if nothing else, you'll hopefully at least get a fun story. So, and um, I, I should mention, as I just did, that this is illegal, don't do it, or if you do, just like, don't tell us about it, okay? So, let's see, we kind of, yeah, we'll, we'll figure it out, okay. Brief introduction. Okay. Let's give this a shot. Okay. Do your, do your, do your best. And we'll just get you back. Hi. Uh, sorry about the, in, the whole thing here. Following from the last bit. Meet the T. The Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority is the public transit agency in Boston. They manage all the buses and the subways. It's also the oldest transit system in the country. We have a picture of the TA's logo and the subway map here, but these are the sides. Cool. Sorry. So, sounds great. How, how can you hop on? Option one, you have traditional fare evasion, which is like hopping the gates or forcing them open, or even just waving your hand over the sensor to make them open. Paying also works. Subway fare is $2.40 and bus fare is $1.70. But there's some problems with these strategies. Traditional fare vision, it's too easy, it's really boring, and you also might get caught. Paying is way too legal, it's also way too boring, and importantly, it costs money. So what do you do? You hack the fare system. Duh. So, how many of you enjoy reading random Wikipedia articles in your spare time? 
All right. Okay. Very good. I certainly do as well. And this whole project started by me actually reading a Wikipedia article, a trolley card Wikipedia article. And I went down to the criticism section, it was the best part of any article, and I saw nice security concerns. And a couple things stuck out to me. Um, one, DEF CON, uh, MIT students, and a federal lawsuit. We'll see if anyone here remembers that. Um, and, <laughs> and Zach can tell you a little bit more about some of these security concerns. So just to get a feel for things, does anybody remember that? He does. Okay. So around 15 years ago, back when dinosaurs roamed the earth and we were two years old, uh, the MIT students figured out how to hack the Charlie cards, or more specifically the Charlie tickets, the Magstripe tickets, and add values up to $600 on them. So they had the same ambition as us and wanted to come here to present. The, MIT, or the MBTA did not like that. So they put out a restraining order against these kids from MIT so they couldn't come here and present. So if the slides were working, we'd have our comically timed gavel and a picture of their restraining order, but, you know, they got sued. So we, um, we actually were inspired by them a little bit. In, when they got sued, their slides, all their research was just put straight into public domain, which allowed people like us to get our grimy hands on them. So let's try to be like them, maybe minus the lawsuit part. So step one, go for the low-hanging fruit. Charlie tickets, they have awful security. And the MIT students, they found out how to clone and reverse engineer them. So seems easy enough free rides for life. So step two, choose your weapon. If the slides were working, you'd be seeing a picture of a Magstripe reader on eBay. Uh, it was $88, little pricey, but it's an investment. Riding the subway is also pricey and an investment. So we're thinking, do we buy a Magstripe reader? The answer is no. So around the time when we started this project, about two years ago, the MBTA actually phased out Magstripe tickets. So any disposable paper tickets were out and actually, actually tappable, which renders them useless to us. So it's time for a new plan. Yeah, so now that trolley tickets were out of the question uh, and the new tappable tickets that replaced them seemed like they actually might have had some decent security, we decided to move on to the trolley cards. So if you're not familiar, uh, there would be a picture up here, uh, but the Charlie card is a contactless smart card. It was introduced in 2004, before any of us were born. Um, you just add money at, at vending machines and you tap cards at fair gates. <laughs> there you go. Um, but how does that actually work? Well, when we first started doing our research about two years ago, we weren't 100% sure. There wasn't very much published research about it. Uh, we kind of assumed that it would use NFC or RFID. How else would you be able to tap it? Um, but we didn't know much more than that until we took a look at the MIT students and their slides. And they described that it used uh, MyFair Classic. Um, and so what is MyFair? So I had to read another Wikipedia article. And I uh, can tell you that it's a standard for data storage and communication. Uh, it's made by a company called NXP. There's a lot of different flavors of it, MyFair Plus, Ultralight, Desfire, that all serve different purposes. But the most famous, or rather infamous flavor, is MyFair Classic. And that's the one they use in the Charlie cards. It's the oldest flavor, and it has uh, NXP's homegrown encryption algorithm called Crypto One. Um, and fortunately for us, it's proprietary, 48-bit, and relies on security through obscurity. Now, if you don't actually like, know anything about crypto, which I'm sure most of you do, uh, that might sound like a good thing because you know, proprietary formulas are touted as like, good or something. 48 is a big number. But any, any encryption algorithm worth its salt is going to have millions of eyes looking on it, looking for ways to improve it. And 48-bit encryption can be cracked in like an hour. So unsurprisingly, some researchers found some holes in it and they tried to publish it and they got met with a whole mess of lawsuits around it. So now that we know what kind of technology we're dealing with, how do we actually talk to these cards? Well, the first step 
and I would have a picture here, uh, was grabbing an NFC reader. Uh, I found one on Amazon for like 40 bucks. Um, it has a, had a convenient USB interface, and there was software out there for it. I then set out trying to figure out how to use that software. It's called LibNFC. Um, but I then sent it right back because I couldn't figure out how to use it. It was too complicated for me. So I had to buy another one. Um, this one's called the Proxmark 3. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but it's kind of like uh, before the Flipper Zero came around, like Swiss Army knife. Um, it was 40, 80 bucks, although some of the really expensive ones can be like three or four hundred dollars. It has some really nice software that's really easy to use. The only problem I had uh, is that it didn't work. Uh, it came to my doorstep and I could like, I opened it up, I could connect to it, but I couldn't really do that whole, you know, reading and writing cards thing that I was supposed to do. So I had to buy another one, about 40 bucks, this time from AliExpress. Uh, I'm sure that's not going to be an issue at all. Um, and it wasn't. Uh, it worked just fine. I could read and write to cards and I had a blast with it um, until, and I also have a picture for this, but uh, the USB, the micro USB header came clean off. Um, and I tried soldering it back onto the board and I couldn't do that. So guess what? I bought another reader. Uh, this one is PN532. It's a nice small red thing. Um, it's about nine bucks and which might be concerning given that we got burned by the last two forty dollar readers. But uh, if you are familiar with it, you'll know why it's nine bucks. It has no USB. It doesn't even come pre-soldered. And it also only works with the Raspberry Pi. But it does like actually work this time, like not just break when you turn your back on it. And what I thought would have been as simple as just buying one NFC reader from Amazon and calling it a day turned into like a two to three month ordeal where I can say that I did at least learn a lot about NFC and NFC readers, and maybe a little more than I would have liked to. Now that we have an NFC reader, uh, we can actually start trying to talk to cards. But before we do that, we need to get the encryption keys. Um, unlike regular encryption that just has like one key or two keys, my Fair Classic has um, 32 keys in total, so you actually need to go out and find them. And while we've established that uh, the encryption they use is pretty terrible, it's still like encryption, so you actually need to get the keys if you want to have any fun. So how do we do that? Well, I found a slideshow from Black Hat called Hacking My Fair Classic Cards. I thought it'd be kind of promising. And I took a look and I it described two different attacks, a uh, nested and dark side attack, uh, and it described some software that implemented that. So I figured, all right, let's give them a go. So the first tool I tried was called MFOC, uh, implements that nested attack, and it does some fancy magic that I don't really understand to get a card's keys. And I gave it a go and uh, it didn't work because you need an initial key. So how do we get that? Well, we can uh, imp try implementing the dark side attack. Uh, fortunately, there's some software called MFCUC uh, that gets the keys kind of like out of thin air. It's kind of cool. I don't know how it works. And I gave it a try um, and it didn't work. I left it running for like 24 hours and I got nothing out of it. And by this point, I was thinking, am I really going to have to buy my third Proxmark and try an attack where I put it in between the card and the turnstile and try to sniff the keys? But then I thought, you know, it would be kind of nice if, they, if the T just kind of left the back door open and used like default keys. So I made a quick Google search, for, or actually DuckDuckGo search, uh, for my fair classic default keys. And I found a pretty awesome repository of like a thousand different keys in it. And I fed them into MFOC, which can take a key list as an input. And there they were. Right there, all 16 of them, A and B, right there in that list. And I was like, holy shit, this is awesome. <laughs> so now that we have the keys, we can actually start reading and writing the cards. So we can grab a binary dump. Um, I, here I would have a picture of a hex editor where you can see the binary data. Um, but obviously you can't see that. Um, so now that we have a binary dump, we can actually try, attempt to implement um, a similar attack that the MIT students did uh, with their cloning. Um, and before you do that, you need yet more special equipment. 
You can't use any old regular MyFair card. Uh, you have to use these special Chinese backdoor magic cards that let you edit the UID for copying. And I had fortunately accumulated a bunch of them with all the like bajillion different NFC readers I had bought. So what I did was I took a dump from a Charlie card, took that hex dump, put it on, um, put on a magic card. Um, okay, so what I did was I took a dump from a trolley card, um, put that on, um, and put it on a magic card, and I tapped it on a reader, and sure enough, it actually worked. I would have a picture of it, and we might in a second, but we'll probably be on, beyond that. Uh, but I have a nice white card tapped on a reader. It's very obviously not a trolley card. But crucially, the reader seemed to believe it was. And I noticed that when I went to tap the Charlie, that clone card on a reader, it worked, it deducted money. But the card that I had copied it from still had its initial value. So if you're kind of paying attention here, you'll, know, you'll notice that, that means that the source of truth isn't in some database somewhere. Um, it's actually right on the card. And the T is trusting people to just not change it. Um, but you can't trust us, so we figured, okay, that means we can actually change it. So let's see, I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember what, I normally have the slides up in front of me. Um, but yeah, that means we can actually attempt to change that. And, but before I did any of that, I wrote a little program that we call Charlie Clone, um, written in C, I spent a lot of time making a little progress bar for it, but it just copies uh, cards pretty efficiently, and we use that for any any future cloning endeavors. And one of the issues uh, with cloning cards, well, it feels kind of like we found the infinite money glitch because you can just copy cards. There are a couple of issues, namely that you, if you want a $50 card, there we have it, yay! <laughs> All right, this is great, this is gonna be a lot easier now. So, um, let's see. Um, there are a couple of issues, mainly that you need an upfront investment. Uh, if you want a $50 card, you're gonna need to spend $50 to do so. Um, and, you know, it might set off some fraud alarms here and there, because they can detect clone cards. We've actually gotten a couple disabled. Um, but, uh, let's see, okay. Um, yeah, so there's a couple issues, yeah, they can detect it. And when the cards do get disabled, you have to spend yet another 50 50 bucks, okay. Nice, okay, here we go. This is what I just described. All right, now we're in business, this is great. Okay. So as you can tell, there's a couple issues with cloning cards, right? So what's better than that? Forging cards, actually trying to put our own data on there and have some fun. So. If we want to forge cards, that means that we actually have to reverse engineer the cards and figure out how they're storing data and figure out what the, what the hell they're doing. So where do we start for that? Well, it makes sense to look at the hex dump. After all, the money is stored on the card, so it must be in here somewhere. Um, I looked around for a couple things that stood out. I noticed a serial number. Um, when you convert the first four bytes, that's the UID, uh, into decimal, they match the number printed on the card. I then tried to change some data. Uh, just, you know, I put in some random data um, and just tried to see what happened. And um, the reader seemed to disagree a little bit. As you can see, it says, cannot read your card or ticket. And then I remembered something, that the Charlie tickets, the old ones, had a checksum in them. It, it was pretty terrible, but there was still some attempt to avoid people just tampering with it or accidental tampering. So. I quickly realized that the data, that the last two bytes that I've highlighted up here in yellow, they might be a checksum. Because if you take a look at the red lines that are just zeros, they still have some of those two weird bytes at the end. And I thought to myself, okay, well, a checksum, that's not too bad, right? I mean, maybe they're just using some standard algorithm and we can just plop the data into the checksum algorithm and have a blast. So I tried some common algorithms. And, and you can, you can see, see a couple, couple pictures, pictures of them, them up here. Uh, I, I tried, tried like 20 or 30 of them. them. And sure, sure enough, none of them worked. worked. So at this point, I didn't really know much about checksum algorithms or much of anything. Um, and I thought, okay, this checksum's a little bit evil. I don't know what they're doing. They're probably having their own algorithm. 
uh, and it's kind of above my pay grade of like zero dollars to try to figure that out. So I figured, okay, cloning cards, you know, there's some issues, but it's just all right. I'll take them and just put this whole project to rest until I met Scott. So I had received a student card uh, in Boston area. If you live far enough away from your school, they'll give you a Charlie card that gives you free transit within a given area, uh, which happens to be where I live. And um, I wanted to clone these cards and maybe share them with my friends. We all get free rides, yay. Uh, and in passing, I mentioned that idea to Maddie at Robotics Club. Uh, we didn't really know it each, other, each other that well at the time, but that started a lifelong friendship, didn't it, Maddie? Uh, um. I got to really press it. All right. So. Um, he'd already figured out how to clone the cards, so we wanted to maybe take the project a little bit further. So a reasonable step seemed to be, let's find where the money is, kind of get our bearings with the data. Uh, so we looked at some hex data together for many hours and hours. What we were trying to do is um, figure out where the money is. We would take a dump of one card, save it, add a bit of money, take another dump, and then compare them in a program called vbindiff and look at the differences. Uh, and then, like, we're trying to figure out which one of these bytes is the money. Uh, there's another accurate 3D rendering. And about 2,000 years later, after much trial and tribulation, we found nothing. So here's a screenshot from that MIT DEF CON slide presentation we were talking about earlier. Uh, and how do you reverse engineer things again? Oh wait, you gotta change it. So we had to figure out how to do that, but that pesky checksum's in the way. So let's try to crack the checksum. Um, so if you look at these two uh, screenshots of binary dumps, uh, there's, as you see in the yellow, that's where the checksum is. Uh, and then there's all those zeros leading up to those two checksums. E those are on two different cards, but even though all the data is the same, uh, the checksum is different. So that's something that's kind of weird, and it probably means they're adding cryptographic salt. And for those of you who don't know, cryptographic salt is a little bit of extra data that you mix in just to make it a little bit harder to go backwards. You do it when you're storing passwords, and m most of you are probably familiar with that. So we tried those off-the-shelf checksum calculators again, but with a bit of salt, and none of them worked. Uh, I spent a little bit of time in my English class doing this, and by a little bit of time, I mean three straight weeks of all day, but I still managed to pass. So that brings us to our first breakthrough. Uh, up until this point, uh, we'd been replicating earlier research, but now we want to try to do something new. Uh, so if you take those two checksums at the end of the line with all those zeros, we thought maybe there's a mathematical relationship between the checksums between the two cards. So we tried a bunch of operations on them, um, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and eventually we landed on the bitwise operation XOR. Uh, for those of you who don't know what XOR is, it's kind of like, it's just like addition or subtraction but for binary. So. Uh, if you look at this, uh, these two hex dump screenshots, you take the checksums. If you XOR those checksums together, you get a value. Uh, that's not surprising, but if you take two different lines that are that have identical data from two different cards and you XOR those together, you get the same value. So that's kind of interesting. Maybe it's something we can work with. Uh, so how do we use it? Uh, the first step to our process is you find two identical lines. So go back to all those zeros. Uh, and then you find a checksum modifier. That's what we call the value you get when you XOR the two checksums together. And we can use it to transfer uh, lines from one card to another card. So you copy any line from those two cards. You can copy the whole line over, uh, checksum and all. Then you XOR the checksum um, that you copied over with the checksum modifier and you get a new checksum and you write that into the checksum slot and boom, the line's copied. So just to recap, uh, here are your instructions if you want to replicate this, which don't, it's bad, 
But you start with two cards, uh, you find out two identical lines, XOR the two different checksums to get a checksum modifier, find a line that you want to move, copy that line onto the other card, XOR the old checksum by the checksum modifier, and profit, but don't profit. So what can we do with this? Uh, you might be thinking, how is this any better than cloning? But remember how those cars get disabled sometimes when you clone them? Now if your card gets disabled, say you put $50 on the card you were cloning. Uh, it gets disabled, those $50 are gone. But we can copy that money line from the old card to the new card, and we can also edit data so it's easier to move from here in reverse engineering. So that moves us on to the next step of trial and error. So up to this point, we had been just copying data from card to card. But we still haven't been able to actually fine tune and edit value. So if you won a $50 card, you still have to spend that initial 50 bucks. So uh, we had also been mostly just sitting at home staring at hex data. And eventually if you want to get things done, you got to go to the re you got to go to some readers and tap them. And where you do that? At a subway station. So if you want to have your own subway station adventure, the first thing you need is an NFC reader and a portable one. We didn't have any portable ones at this point. We had all of them had like died on us. So we had to make our own. We took the PN532, which works with the Raspberry Pi. Here's a picture if you hadn't been able, you hadn't been been able, able to see that. that. Hook, Hook it up, up to a battery, battery bank and, and then toss, toss that whole contraption into your backpack and, and refrain from boarding any airplanes. airplanes. The next, next step is, is to spend hours, or better yet, days, just sitting at a train station trying to um, just kind of reverse engineer stuff. And more about it in the next slide, you can see some of the benches we sat at at those stations. And we got quite familiar with the smell of subway stations. And w while we were sitting there, we tried to make a lot of um, random, or better yet, educated guess based changes to try to figure out mainly how the checksum was working, how it was translating data into those two bytes at the end. Uh, we would mostly try changing some data, seeing what happens, or just try changing the checksum directly. Um, and what we do is we take all the changes, flash them on to some magic cards, run up to the reader, tap them, they'd make a loud Arr! and then we'd run back to our seats, whip out our laptops, and do that like 20 times. All the while we'd try to like hide the cards in our hands to make it like not obvious, even though we're still running up to reader, tapping and running back and whipping out our laptops. But we never got stopped. No one so much as even asked us what we were doing. And so eventually after doing this for long enough, we made a bit of a breakthrough in terms of figuring out where the money is. So we knew that the money um, is stored on the card. And so that means if you take the same card with different, uh, different amounts of money, we know that the money must have changed. So we can take a look at some, some of, of the, the binary, binary differences. differences. This, this program, program right, right here highlights the data in red, red. That's, that's different. different. And, and I, I stumbled, stumbled upon the bytes that, that I've highlighted in yellow. yellow. And, and I, I noticed, noticed something, something about them when you convert, convert them from, from hex into decimal, decimal that you, you get, get these numbers, numbers here. And, and they don't, don't quite look like anything, but if you divide by two, now they start to look a little bit familiar. And, and upon trying this with other cards, we quickly realized that this is where, that, those yellow bytes are where the money's stored. And it's also like in half pennies for some reason. Uh, we, we also found, found that there's two transaction registers, registers one of the current and last values, and that Charlie cards are just kind of weird. So now that we know where the money is, why don't we try to change it? So I'm going to go a little bit into the weeds here, so either get your weed whacker ready or just tell the person next to you, wake you up when I'm done. So the first step when you're trying to figure something out like this is to isolate variables. As you can see here, the only data that's different between these two lines is the stuff highlighting red. That's the money on the left and the checksum on the right. And we tried XORing the two values together between the, diff the different versions. And we chose XOR because that seemed to be the key between copying data between cards, so we figured it might be the key for copying data within a card, or editing data within a card. Um, and we XORed the two money values together, and we got a value highlighted in green that we called the data modifier. We then XORed the two checksums together and got a value highlighted in red that we call the checksum modifier. We call them modifiers because if you kind of shift your perspective uh, in terms of how we change the top line to get to the bottom line, you XOR them by the modifiers. And 
That's a valid way to change data within this line. Now, of course, there's a lot of valid ways to change data between any two lines. But what we wanted to see is if this would work with other data. So we took a card with nothing on it, zero dollars, zero cents, and we XORed the data by the data modifier and the checksum by the checksum modifier, and we got this new line here. And we weren't sure if it worked, but when we went to tap it, it sure did. And so while this isn't anything crazy, it's not even enough to ride the subway, it's still our own homegrown value right here. The next step is to add a quarter. It's a little bit of uh, confusing, so if you don't fully understand it, just trust us. Um, but you need to add a quarter because our, this method replies on XORing things together. And with XOR, you can only, like, if you get saturated with ones, as you can see with the example with 15, there's, there's no way you can keep XORing it to get higher and higher. So you have to add an external value to get another bit, and then you can keep increasing that. So what we did was we added a quarter, and we got a card with $2.60. And then we did the same thing by XORing the values to get a data modifier, XORing the checksums to get a checksum modifier. And then we XORed, we did, applied the strategy we did earlier by taking a card with zero, X, XORing the money by the data modifier and the checksum by the checksum modifier. And we got a new line with $4.95 on it. And we went to tap that. That worked as well. So it means that we have a repeatable strategy that we can just rinse and repeat and um, try as many times to see how high we can get. And we, did, and we did just that. And we got up to $163.84. And as you can see, the buttons are grayed out because past $100, you can't even add any more money. I then, I noted um, by writing down the data and checksum modifiers and seeing how they grow, uh, I saw like a pattern that they basically were doubling and I tried that again one more time and I got up to $327.67, which if you're good with your powers of two, you know that's a signed 16-bit integer limit. And no, we tried. You can't have a negative Charlie card. So we eventually refined this process so we don't actually have to add quarters every time by writing down all the modifiers and building a big table of them. Um, but we got it down to a process like this. You buy a card for a quarter, you, you know, just casually set the value to $327, and then you profit. We chose to open all the fair gates because we're so nice, but if you were a little less scrupulous than us, you could use them for your own personal use, or you could sell them and make the tea very mad at you. So how does this actually work? So pardon me if I go a little bit fast, but we only got 10 minutes left. Um, so we wanted to, uh, that's how we did it, but we wanted to have a more refined version uh, to use in writing programs uh, so we can do this more automatically. Uh, so here's the vocabulary you're going to need to know. Uh, the existing data is what's there. Target data is what you want to be. The data modifier is what you get when you XOR the target, target data and existing data. The existing checksum is what's there, uh, like the checksum that's already on the card. The target checksum is what we need to make the target data valid. The checksum modifier is what. Um, okay, I'm just going to skip part of this down to this. Oh, this slide. Uh, so th this is our process. You XOR the existing data with the target data to get data modifier. Plug the data modifier and uh, the column the data is in into our lookup table. Our lookup table is a super secret black box. META uh, specifically requested that we did not share this. Um, but what that really means is come after maybe 10 bucks and we'll talk. Um, and that spits out a checksum modifier. Uh, finally, you XOR the existing checksum with a checksum modifier to get a target checksum. So there's an example of steps, read really fast. Uh, and a few more station adventures later, we were able to use this to uh, reverse engineer a lot quicker uh, because we can just edit data and see what it does. Uh, here's the animated Charlie card. The, the coolest parts, in my opinion, are the money and the card type. Uh, the money allows us to make a $300 Charlie card, that's cool obviously, and the card type allows us to make employee cards, which are our favorite, uh, blind cards, senior, student cards, whatever we want, uh, we can make it now pretty much. So. Okay, we're on a time crunch here, so what button is it? This one? Okay. Fun gadgets. We did all this stuff, but we need to prove that we can do it. That's me. I thought about it, built a machine. Version one, bad. 
Version two, bad. Version three, horrible. Four, little better, getting there. Version five, the first one, the first version that we showed to the MBTA. The screen's upside down and I broke it. <laughs> version six, I broke it on the way here. <laughs> but it worked, it did everything, changed the data, such as the expiration date, money, and it looks cool. So ingredients, just read blood, sweat, tears, don't do it. So uh, we're gonna go pretty fast here. Bank machine, we chose Tari, lets you do background computation and front end computation separates them. We had, we had a program that reads uh, NFC and MyFair cards on the back end and sends it to a web, basically a web design front end. Oh. Uh, we also have an Android app. It was slapped together in like two nights and super ugly. Uh, we may have React Native. It's very slow too, but it does the job. Part five. Part five. Cool. We're here today. We didn't end up in handcuffs. So, do we go to jail or do we not go to jail? We could have published this, given it to you guys, come to Boston. You know, no more MBTA, no more paying for it at least. But we decided to go to them. So here's an article um, about Bobby Roush. He actually found out how to clone the cards, went to the MBTA, wrote this nice article about him. So we say, hey Bobby, talk to us, man. How do we do this? How do we get in touch? So this is a complaint form for the MBTA. They don't really have a we hacked your transit card form. Um, so we filled it out uh, under question, topic, other, said, hey, we did something. So we thought they were going to react like this, shoo us away, but they responded. Not quite like this, though. That's an email uh, inviting us to their headquarters. So there you are. We went to the meeting, they brought in a bunch of execs, we talked to them about what we'd been working on, how we did it, and how they could prevent us from doing it next time. So that's a real picture of us, just kidding, they didn't allow us to take pictures in there. So post-meeting fun, quickly, picture, picture. The cops got called on us, whole story, ask us afterwards. Come on. Demo. What's our time? Do we got time to play it? Four minutes. Do we do it? Okay, can they do it over there? Can they play the video for us? It's on the laptop. This is their laptop. <laughs> Check files, maybe? <laughs> Not quite. You see it? Oh. Okay. Maybe that other tab of files? There was two. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Wrong one. Wrong one. No, the other video. <laughs> yeah, there I am. Okay, I don't even know if you're going to be able to hear it. We're just going to roll. This is me buying a Charlie card. I bought it, blah, blah, blah. There's, you know, audio. 25 cents, we're cheapskates. Okay, so you'll see the card type is adult, 
has one use. The money on the card is 25 cents. An expiration date January 14th, 2033, and it has no passes on it. So let's say we want to edit the money value. This big money values button. Okay. And we'll go, I don't know, just click some numbers. $251.53. So let's press edit. Let's tap it on the reader. And then press your little edit button here. Give it as I tap it again. And give it another second. And another. There we go. There we go. Okay, so let's check if that did anything. <laughs> um, okay, so as you see, the money value has changed to $251.53. So, how about the card type? Card type, another big button. Uh, let's change it to an employee, because, you know, why not? So we click employee, click edit, put it on the reader, and then press our little button, tap again. Okay. So you'll see the card type, employee with passback. Again, number of uses, one, money on card, $251.53. So one more thing we can, can do we cut the video? is test the expiration date. So uh, that's our time. Thank you guys for being here. Finn, stand up. Give it up for this guy, these guys. Thank you guys so much.